Good evening. Um, my name is Stephen Whiteman, and I am senior lecturer in the art and architecture of China at the Courtauld. On behalf of my co-organizer, uh, Dr. Austin Nevin, who is head of the Department of Conservation at the Courtauld, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first of this year's Frank Davis Memorial Lectures. The Frank Davis Memorial Lecture Series is an annual distinguished lecture series established in honor of Frank Davis, a critic for Country Life magazine, who wrote a bequest from the FM Kirby Foundation. This year, the Frank Davis Memorial Lecture Series consists of two series, Exiles and Emigres, organized by my colleagues Sarah Wilson and Suzanne Babe, which began a couple of weeks ago, and the series we are launching this evening, Art History Futures at the Junction of the Digital and Material Terms. Over the course of five lectures in autumn and spring terms, Art History Futures will present work from leading researchers who are using digital methods in art history and technical history or conservation to think in new ways about our disciplines. We will explore how the digital and computational can be used to advance research and teaching at the Courtauld and in the field, and how new forms of data and digital methods are changing the questions art historians and conservators are asking by casting methodological and ethical concerns in a new light. Finally, the series will highlight questions of issues of equity, access, collaboration, and community building that are raised through the often disparate networks of digital art history, and which are also broader concerns of teaching and research in the contemporary university. Many assume that the digital is somehow oppositional to the material, and that digital approaches risk alienating us from the objects of our inquiries, our works of art architecture, and the subjects of our conservation. As such, the Courtauld, with its venerable tradition of materially oriented scholarship, may seem like an odd fit for digital methodologies. This series will explore how the digital changes our relationship to the object. Indeed, how it estranges us from the object in the literal sense of the word, making it once again strange or new, thereby opening new paths of inquiry to the researcher. With its true strengths in conservation and innovative art history, the Courtauld is uniquely well positioned to stage a discussion about forms of close looking and engagement enabled by the digital, often in a very nuanced relationship with more traditional, quote unquote, methodological approaches. This evening's inaugural lecture is, in, is ideally suited to launching us on this journey. Dr. Emily Pugh is head of digital art history at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, California. An architectural historian by training, she has published widely on modern architecture, including her book, Architecture, Politics and Identity in Divided Berlin, which appeared with the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2014 and essays, exhibitions and edited volumes on Ed Rusha, Gordon Mata Clark, Keith Herring, Hans Scharen, and others. Equally impressive, but representing a second distinct area of her research, is her work in digital art history, in which she has been working for nearly 20 years. Prior to joining the Getty, Emmy, Emily served as Robert H. Smith postdoctoral assistant in digital art history at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, or CASVA, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And she was for many years the publication developer for digital art history projects at the journal 19th Century Art Worldwide, an early pioneer in digital art history publishing. At the Getty, she has responsibility for a wide range of projects, including the complex digitization of the Getty's collection of architectural models and its photo archives. Her writing in digital art history has focused on two areas in particular that are especially apropos to our discussions this year and in the future. First, how to expand our own art historical practices and understandings to include the digital, practically and conceptually. And second, the questions attending the introduction of the digital into fields, namely art and architectural history, that have been so profoundly shaped by their interaction with the photograph. Her talk tonight, Digital Imaging as Disciplinary Practice, Photography and Art History, builds on both these themes. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Emily Pugh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that introduction. Um, thank you to Stephen and to Austin for inviting me to give the inaugural lecture in this series. Um, I'm excited to join you this evening slash morning. And let me get my slides up. Um, I'm excited to hear your thoughts and questions after my presentation. Let's begin in 1893. 
When art historian Bernard Berenson wrote enthusiastically in The Nation about photographs that had recently been made of paintings in Venice and took the opportunity to reflect on the influence the camera had had on the connoisseurship of art. Quote, few people are aware how completely connoisseurship has changed since the days before railways and photographs when it was more or less of a quack science in which every practitioner, often in spite of himself, was more or less of a quack. As Berenson noted, and as other scholars have since explored in more detail, the technologies of mechanized image production and mechanized travel had a profound impact on art history. The camera and the train influenced connoisseurship, yes. But more than this, these technologies made art history as a discipline possible, allowing for its development on a scale beyond the individual moneyed esteem. Berenson's comment reveals something else as well. The tension within art history between the objective and subjective, between the precise, measurable, and scientific on the one hand, and the open-ended, emotive, and humanistic on the other. I'm not here today to tell you that art history is more one than the other or to express a preference either way. In fact, my view is that it is the productive tension between these two poles that characterizes the discipline. We seek to know what we can about an artwork scientifically, what it is made of, who painted it, when, etc. at the same time that we explore what and how it means and to whom. With regard to Berenson's comments about photography, what I want to draw your attention to is the role technology, in this case, imaging technology, played in his negotiation between the scientific and the humanistic. For Berenson, isochromatic photography provided a way to capture Venetian paintings more precisely and accurately as compared with earlier imaging technologies or even in-person viewing. In offering this more precise view, photography reset the boundaries for Berenson between what could be known for certain about these paintings versus what was speculative knowledge between fact and interpretation. A similar resetting of these boundaries has been initiated in the last 20 or so years by digital imaging technologies, which in many ways allow us to capture, measure, and document artworks more precisely and accurately than analog photography. My talk today is about how art history as a field might respond in a more conscious and critical way to the shift in the boundaries between the certain and the speculative that digital imaging technologies have precipitated. To be clear, my intention is not to construct a set of strict binaries. Scientific inquiry requires speculation, just as humanistic inquiry requires a certain amount of factual evidence. Rather, what I want to examine is how we construct certainty and knowledge in relation to images. What are the conceptual models we as a field use for understanding how a digital image relates to the thing it depicts? Are these models an accurate reflection of how digital imaging functions? And what are the implications if they are versus if they are not? My talk begins with an exploration of the complexity of digital imaging and digital image infrastructures by which I mean the systems in which digital images and information about those images is managed and made accessible to scholars. In exposing this complexity, my intention is to demonstrate how a greater understanding of digital imaging can make art historians more critical users of images in their day-to-day -day practice. However, in addition, I want to argue that while art historians may think of digital imaging primarily as a convenience, a way to view artworks they have not yet had the opportunity to visit, for example, or to conduct archival research remotely. Digital imaging is also one part of a much larger process by which art historical information is transformed into various formats of machine readable data. Far from subordinate to the work of research or scholarship, I argue that this datafication of art historical information, of which digital imaging is just one part, is an increasingly central part of what it means to practice art history. The datafication I'm describing is in many ways the contemporary iteration of a longer evolution in art historical inf information production and exchange that ultimately began in the 19th century with technologies like photography. 
Looking again at the Berenson quote, we can see that implicit in it, and indeed in the text of Berenson's article as a whole, are assumptions about scientific objectivity and its valued art history, both morally and as a heuristic tool. Implicit also are assumptions about the objectivity of photography and specifically an appreciation of photography as a tool for standardization and rationality. In our own time, we tend to regard objectivity and subjectivity in relation to photography as existing along a spectrum. We continue to regard photos as documentary evidence, although we also understand that photos can be manipulated for a wide variety of reasons from artistic to nefarious. Art historians generally don't find this cognitive dissonance overly unsettling, in part because navigating and understanding how and where photographs fall across the spectrum is a central facet of the study of art history. Our ability to conduct such analyses is supported by our understanding of how photography works. We all have a basic conception of the photographic process. The camera's shutter opens and shuts to register an image. A negative is made and printed. The print is disseminated in publications, for example, or hung in exhibitions. Furthermore, we understand that the decisions made in each step of this process have implications for what the photograph looks like, what information it conveys about the thing it depicts, and its reception by a viewing public or by critics or scholars. Indeed, many scholars have explored the way photographic representation has shaped discourses around art and architecture. Frederick Borer, for example, has argued that photography played a central role in shaping the subject of art history, writing in his 2002 essay, Photography and the Institutional Formation of Art History, quote, the centrality of Italian Renaissance painting within art history and subsequent emphasis on two-dimensional linear perspective are not just documented, but reified by the conditions of photographic rendering. Similarly, similarly Claire Zimmerman demonstrated in her 2014 book, Photographic Architecture in the 20th Century, how particular approaches to photography shape the interpretation and reception of so-called international style architecture from the 1920s through the post-war period in Europe and the US. And in their book, Photography and Sculpture, The Art Object and Reproduction from 2017, editors Megan Luke and Sarah Hamill assembled essays from various scholars to, the, to address the question of, quote, how does photography shape our relationship to a given object, showing us where to stand and what to see? We can and should train a similar set of questions on digital imaging of artworks and the digitization of art historical primary sources, source materials more generally. We can and should ask, to paraphrase Luke and Hamill, how does digital imaging shape our relationship to a given object, showing us where to stand and what to see? This is what I propose to do today, beginning with the two most common forms of digital imaging encountered by art historians, imaging of individual artworks and museums, and mass digitization of primary source materials in archives and libraries. Cultural, imaging, cultural heritage imaging specialists generally divide their work into four types, reproduction, object photography, technical imaging, and computational imaging. I want to start with the first two. Reproduction refers to the documentation of so-called flat works of art, including paper-based works, as well as paintings. While object photography is exactly what it sounds like, the capture of 3D artworks, such as sculptures, coins, or gems. The key difference between the two is that object photography is understood to require from the photographer more subjective decisions about lighting and camera position as compared with reproduction. However, in both cases, imaging is executed in highly controlled studio environments under precise lighting conditions using high-end digital cameras that are often mounted on elaborate lit rigs. The processes of image capture and processing are further executed using rigorous standards developed by imaging scientists designed to regulate how physical properties are rendered in the finished image. Color targets, seen here, for example, are used to maintain precise accuracy in how color is reproduced. 
What results are images like these, which often appear on museums collection pages, along with all the relevant details about the objects depicted. These images perform many of the same function at functions as did Berenson's photographs of Venetian paintings. They serve as visual references for art historians of the objects they depict. Such images are assembled on scholars' hard drives into collections that are used in research, teaching, and perhaps also as illustrations in published pieces of scholarship. Of photographs like these, art historian Ivan Gaskell wrote in his 2000 book, uh, Vermeer's Wager, quote, the naturalization of the object as an image is one of the most radical and far reaching consequences of the overwhelming use of phot photographic reproductions and is especially exaggerated in the case of, repro of the reproduction of paintings. While these examples do present artworks as images, they at the same time foreground tensions between image and object. This tension, always implicit in photography, is revealed in the way cultural heritage images imaging is categorized. A distinction is made between reproduction, which by its very name suggests a mechanic, mechanized objective record, and object photography, which is defined by its greater subjectivity. At the same time, both approaches inevitably require subjectivity, and drawings and paintings are also objects. Why should painting fall in the reproduction category and not object photography? The primary reason must be related to the long tradition of photographing paintings as so-called flat art. As Gaskell suggests, their meaning is perceived to be contained wholly in the image on their surface. But in the modern context, the objectness of even a painting becomes more apparent once it is photographed using the sophisticated techniques of contemporary cultural heritage imaging practice. In the images of Vincent van Gogh's 1889 painting, Irises, we can clearly see the surface of the canvas, the texture and handling of the paint. Similarly, the image of the engraved gem reveals information about the materiality of this object, including tiny details of the engraved image and scratch marks in the gold setting. Images like these can in many ways be regarded as akin to the products of technical imaging, a set of processes that includes techniques like breaking light photography and x-ray. In this false color image of a mummy portrait in the collection of the Getty Villa, for example, an x-ray fluorescence map uses colors to communicate the presence of the lead pigment in the painting. In all three examples, due in part to the scientific rigor with which they were created, these images constitute a form of physical analysis. The pixels that form the images correspond in precise and scientific ways to the physical reality of the object they depict. Incidentally, it was the ability of isochromatic photography to faithfully render physical materiality that endeared it so to Berenson. Because what he called ordinary photography altered the color value of paintings, rendering blue as white or red as black, the resulting photo prints required corrections through retouching, a process that according to Berenson took them, quote, farther and farther from the original, unquote. Isochromatic photography, by contrast, maintained relative color values, creating, quote, accurate and impersonal renderings that Berenson deemed far superior. It is this same desire for accurate and impersonal renderings that underpins the rigorous standards that govern imaging science, and thus that drives the creation of digital images of artworks. The goals of objectivity and accuracy are implicit in the images presentation on its collection page. For which, for, for example, which includes information about the object, but not about the photograph, such as when it was made, who made it, or how it was made. And the creation of the image represents only one part of a larger image infrastructure. What technologies are used for the image viewer and how are they interacting with the digital image file? Is the image being adjusted in some way, reduced in quality or broken up into tiles, for example, to fit the parameters of an online viewer? While information like this may or may not be relevant to scholars, the fact remains that we can determine very little about this image or how it was produced and processed from how it appears on the museum's website. The image appears authorless and out of time, 
a pristine and objective document that we are encouraged to see through to the object it depicts. The fact that digital cameras are so good at capturing all the minute physical attributes of the object only serves to make the image seem even more transparent. Yet, ironically, this effort to capture impersonal, accurate images of artworks also drives the use by cultural heritage imaging specialists of extensive post-processing and computational means in an effort to make what, are, what is deemed to be the most accurate objective images possible. Post-processing, the modern day equivalent to Berenson's retouching, can include color correction, adjustments of lightness or brightness, as well as cropping and image compositing. In the case of this engraved gem, for example, we might assume we're looking at a single image. In fact, we're looking at a composite of over 50 images of this 1.7 centimeter gem. These 50 plus images have been computationally stitched together to create a single rendering. This process called focus stacking allows for the creation of images in which the object appears in perfect focus throughout the picture plane. It is regularly used on small objects like this. In fact, all kinds of computational means are used increasingly to make high fidelity images of artworks. In the early 2000s, in order to photograph its famous unicorn tapestry, the Metropolitan Museum digitally corrected the numerous individual images of the work which had inadvertently recorded the movement of the fabric under the camera lens. The resulting image of the tapestry required three months of calculation and 24 hours to computationally assemble. More recently, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam leveraged artificial intelligence to create a digital image of Rembrandt's 1642 painting, The Night Watch, that is over 44 billion pixels in size. Because these examples represent attempts to faithfully render flat art, they may be considered reproduction imaging. Yet their reliance on algorithms starts to bring them closer to computational imaging, a process defined by the use of computers to indirectly form images. Processes like focus stacking and digital image correction should not be thought of in simplistic terms as mere subjective manipulation, or as resulting in the creation of false images. Because all images are ultimately representations of the objects they depict, the question is not whether a particular image was manipulated. Rather, the question is how the image was created and processed. It is only knowing more about the nature of this manipulation, after all, that art historians can understand what these images are actually showing, and thus use such images in their research in critically engaged ways. Interestingly, however, while there are extensive scientific standards for creating such images, there are not uniform guidelines for applying these standards or for communicating how they are applied. For example, imaging practices can vary from institution to institution, determined by internal priorities as much as by external or disciplinary demands. Ultimately, much of what is controlled and standardized about the creation of digital images is internal to the field of cultural heritage imaging and does not necessarily relate to the use of the images in, for example, the field of art history. In other words, while the means by which images are created is regulated by standards, the goals of doing so are vague and largely unarticulated. Imaging specialists seek to create an objective image, a concept which is not explicitly defined, but which is usually assumed to mean an image that presents the object in such a way as to replicate the experience of seeing it in person. Yet in-person viewing by no, is by no means the only way to gain an objective view of an object. And moreover, the goal of objectivity as we've seen drives the creation of images that are in many ways hyper-realistic digital renderings that convey detail it would be impossible to see with the naked eye. Between the scientific standards that govern cultural heritage imaging and the use of the resulting digital images by scholars in their art historical research lies a gray area in which the borders between the objective and the subjective are not only difficult to discern, they are largely unexamined. 
But similar gray area can be found between the practices of mass digitization and scholars' use of digitized archives and books in their research. For the most part, mass digitization takes the form of reproduction. Phot uh, photographers seek to image flat objects, such as letters, photos, or manuscripts, as faithfully as possible. The key difference from imaging in the museum context is that mass digitization is usually about capturing the information the object contains. For example, when mass digitizing letters, what is important is to, ma to maintain is the legibility of the text on the page, rather than capturing the physical qualities of the paper the text is printed on. Of course, mass digitization is also driven less by the quality of the image than by their rate of production. The idea is to produce images as quickly as possible. Thus, while imaging specialists working in a museum might photograph a single object over the course of a week, those working in a library or archive might photograph 1,000 objects in the same time frame. As a result, in part of the focus on speed, the complexity of mass digitization is entailed less in the capture and creation of the image and more in the creation and management of the images themselves as data, along with the information about them also as data and more specifically metadata. Thus, in increasing the scale of image production, mass digitization necess necessitates elaborate data-based systems for tracking this visual and textual data storing it and providing ways for scholars to access it. This increase in scale on multiple levels represented by mass digitization turns out to have far reaching implications for how art historical information is created and stored and therefore how it is accessed and used to produce art historical knowledge. To illustrate these implications, I will use as a case study the mass digitization of a portion of a particular collection at the Getty Research Institute, The Streets of Los Angeles, created by the artist Ed Boucher. As I will explain, in digitizing this collection, the GRI did not merely create a digital surrogate of the physical archive, but transformed the collection into something else, something distinct from its physical version. The Streets of Los Angeles collection began when Ed Ruscha set out to take photographs of the facades of the build buildings lining Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles in 1965 for his book, Every Building on the Sunset Strip. After experimenting with different approaches, Ruscha ultimately chose one based on driving a truck up and down the street with a tripod mounted camera in its bed, snapping pictures at regular intervals. After Every Building was published, Ruscha continued this project. He would send his studio assistants out in the truck, often early on Sunday mornings when fewer people and cars were about, to drive slowly from one end to the other of not only Sunset, but also Melrose Avenue, Hollywood Boulevard, and other major thoroughfares in West Los Angeles. The project continued through the 1970s into the early 2000s and is still going today. In 2012, rather, the Getty Research Institute acquired a portion of the Streets of Los Angeles collection, including all the shoots made from 1965 to 2010. And by the term shoot, I mean a, a set, each set of images of an entire street that were made in a single day. This 2012 acquisition comprised about a half million images in total. After it came to the Getty, the next step was to process Ruscha's archive. Archival processing includes physical assessment of the materials as well as cataloging, which produces a textual description of the collection, known as collections metadata. Portions of this collections metadata ultimately appear in the library's catalog and are used for access. Digitization is usually considered an additional step outside of processing and is not done for every collection. However, most of the streets of Los Angeles, its collection is in the form of under, undeveloped negatives. And many of those were shot onto motion picture stock that was then spooled onto film reels. Digitization was therefore the only way to make large parts of the collection accessible to researchers and therefore was regarded as a critical part of processing. 
A team made up of curators, metadata experts, and technical imaging specialists began by deciding on a subset of the streets of Los Angeles collection to digitize first, ultimately selecting 25 shoots or approximately 20% of the collection. Members of the Getty's imaging team built a custom rig here on the right to photograph these 25 shoots, a process that produced about 130,000 digital images. The next step was to generate additional metadata that could be linked to each image in order to make the images discoverable. By discoverable, I mean providing ways for these images to be searched, allowing researchers to find the specific images they are interested in among the 130,000. This is a critical component of any mass digitization project. If images cannot be searched or browsed, after all, they are of little use to researchers. In the case of Ruscha's collection, the process of metadata creation was particularly important, but also challenging due to the scale of images. Ultimately, the GRI sought to support searches by street address, hiring an external partner to generate geospatial information for each image. In addition, we used optical character recognition or OCR to mechanically read the signage and other text in the image and convert it to machine readable searchable text. The Getty software engineers took the resulting visual and textual information, that is the images, the catalogers descriptions, OCR text and geospatial or GIS coordinates and fed this data into a user interface. This user interface known as the Research Collections Viewer or RCV presents the archive within an organizational hierarchy based on the collection's finding aid. It allows researchers to browse the images and search by street addresses as well as by the text in the image. As a result of the Getty's efforts, there are now two forms of the Streets of Los Angeles collection. Oops. There is first the physical collection, which includes the reels of spooled films, cut strips of negatives, and spiral bound notebooks full of handwritten project details. The physical collection also includes the full production archive for the 1966 book, Every Building on the Sunset Strip, as well as production materials related to the to Richer's 2005 Scheidel publication, Then and Now, Hollywood Boulevard, 1973 to 2004, which you see in the bottom right. The physical collection has very distinctive material qualities. The spools of negatives are large and heavy, and many betray the distinctive odor of decaying film stock afflicted with what is known as vinegar syndrome. The production archive for every building includes Ruscha's scotch tape mock-ups for the book. The then and now book is oversized and stored in a large wooden case that it takes two people to manage. Much of this materiality is lost in the second digital form of the archive. Cataloged information about the entire collection is accessible through the online catalog although only a portion of it is available via digital images. What has been digitized is presented as a group of images, mostly positives that have been created from the largely undeveloped negatives. The digitized version privileges an understanding of the collection as images, but also as a trove of visual and textual data that can be browsed, searched, viewed microscopically, microscopically by zooming into individual frames or macroscopically through data visualizations, for example. In addition, the interface was designed so as to provide ways for researchers to export the data and combine it with other data sets, such as tax assessor records that indicate who, who owned particular lots or their financial value at particular times. Furthermore, images are placed within a visual structure and information hierarchy that gives them order and meaning absent in the collection's physical form. For example, navigating to a single image in the RCV reveals a map. There it is. Uh, with pins indicating the location where the selected photograph and those related to it in the collection were taken. The interface places these photos within the logic of a geospatial system of reference, foregrounding their significance as markers of physical space. The visual design and structure of the RCV interface makes the collection easier to browse, 
At the same time, this design and structure adds a layer of interpretation on top of these images, influencing how they are presented to researchers, including what information they do or do not see. In this way, the interface inevitably shapes researchers' interpretation of the archive. Archive professionals have generally regarded digitized archives as surrogates for the object they depict. They have considered these digital surrogates copies of an original and therefore of little to no significant intellectual value in and of themselves. However, while in some cases, the digitized archive corresponds relatively closely to the physical, in other cases, as archivists are beginning to acknowledge, the digital version of an archive can hardly be thought of as a mere copy or surrogate. As the example of the streets of Los Angeles demonstrates, the extensive data structures that mass digitization produces and it's subject to inevitably transform the physical collection. Digitization shapes art historical practice in indirect ways as well. Both mass digitization and imaging of artworks in the museums requires repositories to develop an addi additional methods and processes for describing and providing access to digital versions of collection objects. Related to, but distinct from those that manage access to physical objects. This diagram, for example, illustrates the complex workflow through which the images that result from digitization are loaded into the GRI's collection systems combined with archival data and deposited into our systems of preservation and public access. Larger collections and larger images inevitably place pressure on these systems. In the case of the streets of Los Angeles, for example, one of the largest components of this archive, a digitized reel of color film from 2004 depicting Hollywood Boulevard was so large, it was nicknamed by archival staff, the monster reel. While a typical set of digital image data might take a few hours to deposit into the GRI's collection management systems, the first attempt to deposit the monster reel took two full weeks and ultimately failed. The team eventually deposited the monster reel successfully, but only after many months of work, which included direct consultation with the company that manages our preservation system software. The vast stores produced by digitization, it should be noted, require management not only at the moment of their creation, but in perpetuity. Thus, although it is digital, data has materiality and material consequences. As computer scientist Paul Dorish argues in his 2017 book, The Stuff of Bits, quote, the specific material instantiations of the data have implications for where it can be stored and therefore for the kinds of institutions that can afford to house it, for how quickly it can be moved from place to place, for how easily elements can be accessed and so on. In turn, he continues, this shapes our ideas about the kinds of questions that can be asked of data, the sorts of information we have available to us and what we assume is worth collecting. Not only does the materiality of data influence how we collect and use it, but as Dorsch suggests, the existence of data has consequences for whether or to what extent particular artworks and traditions are studied. Artworks that cannot be photographed are less visible and so too are domains of cultural production that cannot be digitized or that have not been as extensively digitized as for example, non-European or oral traditions. How might the existence of digitized archives or the lack thereof be making particular areas of cultural heritage more versus less visible? Conversely, to what extent is mass digitization creating an echo effect, wherein artists like Ruscha or Rembrandt that are already well known only grow more so? If photography's suitability for reproducing Italian Renaissance art facilitated the study of it, so too will digitization processes make particularly visible those collections that submit more easily to the demands of datafication. This was the case, for example, with the Streets of Los Angeles collection, which was photographed and documented so thoroughly as to allow it to be computationally cataloged more easily. Moreover, what is particularly noteworthy about the collection is that each of its form relies on the other. Neither the physical nor the digital version of the collection makes sense on its own. 
Is the physical archive significant? Is it useful? Yes, of course. No. Having completed dozens of shoots over 50 years, Rouché produced what is a fundamentally an in in inaccessible archive, a pile of thousands upon thousands of negatives with supporting documentation that includes both like the name of a particular street that was shot or the year it was shot, but also in seemingly inconsequential details like where the crew ate lunch on the day of the shoot and how much they paid for gas. The digital version of the collection provides the only way to see positives of these images, but also to browse and search them meaningly, meaningfully. Even so, the digitized version is also an incomplete view of the collection. It likewise does not make sense on its own. This mutual dependence, I would argue, stems from the fact that this is an archive about archiving. Far from a violation of Rouchet's project, digitization can be thought of as a further step in its evolution, one entirely keeping with Rouchet's vision for it and that of his artistic practice overall. In books like Every Building on the Sunset Strip, but also Some Los Angeles Apartments from 1965 or 34 Parking Lots from 1967, Rouchet com compiled photographs of apparently random numbers of objects or sites, themselves randomly chosen. The resulting books, on the one hand, convey nothing much in particular. As art critic David Borden wrote in 1972, quote, the nonverbal books managed to avoid saying anything at all on a rational level. Yet by placing them within structured information formats, specifically a list, Rouché generates meaning. In other words, by creating a list based on an arbitrary category and then populating it with the most mundane contents possible, unremarkable image, images of unremarkable subjects, Rouché is drawing attention to the power of an information structure to by itself generate meaning, even out of meaninglessness. As Borden wrote of some Los Angeles apartments, quote, Rouché merely shows us what the apartments look like, and that provides sufficient information to ponder. The same kind of logic informs the streets of Los Angeles collection, which were one of Rouché's books might have been titled something like Some Los Angeles Streets. As in his books, Rouché created a structure based on a seemingly arbitrary category, the street, and has filled that structure with self-consciously mundane images. The archived version of the streets of Los Angeles in both its physical and digital forms can thus be interpreted as an exploration of the tension between meaning and meaninglessness, between the production of knowledge and the mere accumulation of information, a tension which only grows alongside our ability to produce, to mass produce images. Rouchet's project has not ended now that it has become part of an archive, but through its digitization continues to evolve. The Streets of Los Angeles collection is in many ways an outlier, an extreme example of the kinds of material and immaterial transformations of art historical information that digital imaging can precipitate. At the same time, however, Rouchet's collection is a sign of where things are headed. Ruche is of course just one artist who was working at the start of the post-war information explosion, taking advantage of the technologies that allowed for mass production and storage of data, but also making information itself the subject of his artistic practice. The transfer of collections like Ruche's, as well as of born digital collections produced in the era of personal computing and the internet to archives, libraries, and museums is but one of the reasons such institutions are experimenting with ways to process and digitize collections at scale. The deployment of computational means for generating metadata, like optical, optical character recognition, is likely to become common practice. As a result, archivists may soon be using the digital image itself to catalog collections rather than the physical item. Indeed, Rouchet's collection, along with the images of engraved gems and Van Gogh's irises, are all examples that simply make more apparent the transformations endemic to all forms of digitization. As media theorist Johanna Drucker has argued, quote, digitization is not representation, but interpretation. 
noting that every choice made about transforming an analog image into a digital file or, in the case of born digital materials, creating the original format is part of a chain of decisions. These decisions carry interpretive inflection. They are not neutral or value-free, and each privileges one aspect of a digital artifact at the expense of, another, of others. Art historians are, of course, used to analyzing images as subjective representations. The problem in the context of digital images is that we do not always have the relevant information to understand how and what they are being used to represent. However, in addition, we are not always used to analyzing images as data, but rather continue to interact with images even in their digital form as photographic objects. My own laptop, for example, is filled with folders of JPEGs and TIFFs that are functionally no different than drawers full of 35 millimeter slides. Yet when viewed at scale, it becomes apparent that photography, that is the production of images, is only one part of digital imaging. A far larger component of the digital imaging apparatus is the systems in which the information or data about these images and about the objects they depict are created, managed, stored, and made accessible. This information, along with the images themselves, of course, all takes the form of data. Looked at in this way, it becomes clear that digital imaging is one part of a larger ecosystem of art historical information creation that is managed by curators, librarians, archivists, and imaging specialists. Digital imaging is data creation. It is fundamentally no different than the process by which archivists catalog and archive. Creating collections metadata that describes papers, photos, or books is input into collections management systems and used to search and browse that archive. Both archival processing and digital imaging are outcomes of archives, libraries, and museums' use of digital technologies and their power to encode any form of information, visual, textual, auditory, into machine-readable data. Librarians and archivists, as well as curators, have been creating data about artworks and art history for decades. It is a primary activity in these fields. What is perhaps different now is that all scholars participate in this information and ecosystem as well, whenever we download, compile, and analyze our own research data sets. This has been a distinct shift in our practice over the tw past 20 or so years. Until recently, information creation and search was institutionally confined. Scholars searched the catalog of a specific library they were either present in or planned to visit. And the goal of their search was to gain access to a physical object located there. Today, scholars routinely conduct a variety of searches of a variety of different types across multiple repositories, all from the same browser windows. Scholars also regularly rely on corporations such as Google for sourcing images. Whether in a collections catalog or Google images, the point of these searches is not always to get to a physical object, but rather to consult the digital image of a particular object or to view data about the physical item. Digital information is often the end goal of our searches, although at the same time, we are generally speaking not trained uh, to use, analyze, or critique digital information in its native forms. We feel the pain of this gap between our need to work with data and our ability to do so every time we hunt for a lost JPEG or email on our laptop. The centrality of data to our daily practice as art historians can at times be difficult to recognize, in part because it is often obscured in discourses around the use of digital technologies within art history. In discussions of digital art history, for example, digital technologies are often discussed as existing outside of the mainstream of disciplinary practice. And thus, their use within art history is framed in either or terms. Is digital art history good or bad? Is it an effective approach to research and scholarship, or has it failed utterly to produce new insights? The problem with this kind of either or framing is that by focusing on whether digital technologies are used, the questions of how, why, or when such technologies are used are deferred. As a result, discourse remains limited to what can be said at the highest level about what is sometimes referred to collectively as a quote unquote digital, rather than engaging with particular technologies and their application. In the absence of a more incisive critique, 
it becomes more difficult either to leverage the potential or avoid the pitfalls of using technologies in art, art historical practice. In fact, as the example of digital imaging demonstrates, the digital always coexists with the material and the traditional with the new, the objective with the subjective. As I've already suggested, it's perhaps useful to think of the digital imaging suite as analogous to the conservation lab. The work of the technical experts in both unites practical concerns of access and preservations of material, preservation of materials, whether physical or digital, with intellectual concerns regarding the nature of artworks and what their constituent materials can tell us about who made them, how, and why. In both sites as well, these experts explore the representation of physical objects in terms of data, whether this means the lines of code in a digital file as in the imaging suite, or the refractive index of a particular pigment as in the lab. In both cases as well, the outcomes of the work of these technical experts often prompts scholars to reconsider how we have understood particular artworks and surfaces questions related to evidence, authenticity, originality, translation, and integrity. It is these questions that should be the center of any conversation about digital art history, not questions of technology per se, but questions of disciplinary practice that technological development has made more apparent or more pressing. Our expectations for art history are in some ways no different now than they were for Berenson in 1893, when he wrote, quote, of the writer on art today, we all expect not only that intimate acquaintance with his subject, which modern means of conveyance have made possible, but also that patient comparison of a given work with all the other works by the same master, which photography has rendered easy. Indeed, Berenson's text provides a reminder that technological innovation is not something new to art history, a product of the digital age, but rather is woven into the very fabric of the discipline. Oops. And while we are right to regard with skepticism the kind of positivism betrayed by Berenson's description of photography, we can and should bring the same critical acumen we train on photographs to not only digital images, but the datafication of art historical information more generally. The goal in doing so would be less to maintain or impose some kind of strict objectivity onto a particular technology or data-based approach, and more to remain consciously aware of the relationships between the objective and subjective, to manage the process by which one becomes the other, and to make this process transparent and explicit. In doing so, we can better understand the relationship between technology and art historical practice in ways that hopefully allow us to understand and shape this relationship in critically engaged ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for that really rich and incredible talk. Um, it's been such a pleasure. I want to um, invite uh, members of the audience to put questions in the chat, which we will see, and um, and there already is one. And so I'm going to Austin and I will give a couple of minutes for people to to think about uh, their questions. We have plenty of time. Um, I want to start. Um, I, I always get. I want to first of all like say well done to the Chinese art historian who managed to mispronounce Ed Richet's name before we were even out of the gate. It's all right. Okay. It's, a, it's really common. I, I, oh, no, I'm sure it is, but it, you should hear the other names that I mispronounce. It's really, it's really <laughs> gruesome. Um, so, but I want to go just for a second to think, um, ask you to think a little, well, maybe crystal ball -y, but also um, just about projects that you've seen. And to go back to this issue of site that you started with around Berenson, around, uh, and then you continued in various ways throughout. The idea that a photographic archive having all the pictures by the master in front of you um, changes. It's very easy in my own field to say, oh, well, the 18th century Chenlong Emperor was a terrible connoisseur. Well, of course, because I have all the paintings that he had and all the paintings he thought he had in front of me now, and I can see what they look like. So for, for one thing, photography changes our appreciation of connoisseurship, but also you highlighted um, you highlighted the the hyper realistic or the hyper detailed um, capacity of photography, and um, and so both of these are forms 
that I would sometimes call supernatural sight. I'm either in more than one place at a time, or I can see more than the naked eye can allow me to see. Berenson obviously was part of a large generation who fundamentally changed the way we thought about art and the way we, we sort of both visually and phenomenologically related to works of art because of the photograph. And I guess what I want to ask is, is there a similar transformation ahead of us now? Are we changing the way, will the digital change the way that we relate to the work of art? Is art history, is this just a matter of big data? And can I get my arms around Ed Ruscha in, a, in all those photos in some logical way? Or is there also, are there also implications for, for the individual object? Um, or for the discipline as a whole, you've talked about a lot of the implications, but like, what is what is this next revolution and how we visually engage with art, do you think um, hold for us? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, one thing I would say is like, I think the example you, you're talking about these impossible views or these supernatural views and also the idea of like what imaging technology are available to different people at different times is that um, I think because of the way photography is used in art history is so naturalized, we sometimes forget of all the power structures inherent in that and thinking about like the ability to, to image, to have images, to share images is, or even like down to bandwidth, having bandwidth to transfer large image sets, et cetera, that these are all like um, to do with different sort of levels of, of power, right? And also that, um, you know, the, those images, say, of the gem, you know, in this like pristine space, I mean, I'm, they serve a particular function of really sort of highlighting those as objects, but they're also completely abstracted from the conditions of viewing of that object as it would be at the time. And again, I think there's a way in which we're so naturalized to see photos like that for not just in the digital context, but in a longer period of time that we, on the one hand, I think as art historians are always in our head know that we're looking at representations, but on the other hand, always forgetting and always forgetting that um, we need to situate these documents, that is the photographs within, you know, this larger context and in relation to the object they're, they're, uh, that they're depicting. Hmm. In terms of the second part of your question, I'll just say that um, I think inevitably as we deal more with art historical information as data, that will change our relationship both to images on mass and to individual objects. Because while, and I think if a term like big data, I'd like to think about, I mean, really in art history, we don't have big data on the level they have in other fields. But what I would say is that our form of big data is just any form of data that we can't conceptualize in our brains, but need a computer to help us understand, right? And I think that level of big data can exist in the context of a collection like Rouchet's, which is half a million images, 130,000 digitized, but it can also exist on the level of even a single object. Think of the engraved gem, the 50 plus photos that were created of it. Um, at the end of that process, you have three different forms of an image that the museum maintains. You have all the different, <laughs> all the, you know, all of the forms of information that you can have about an object like that, technical information, object information, provenance information, that starts to, even though you're talking about a single object, that by itself starts to feel like big data. I think um, what, the sense that of the scale being an issue now is less that there's like more information now than there used to be, but rather we have a capacity to, to sort of organize, understand, retrieve that information ourselves in a way that we haven't before. And I think that has to inevitably sort of mean some changes uh, in how we engage with all of this stuff. I wanna, I know that Austin probably has a question too, but I just wanna follow up on, if I could, on one aspect of that. The, you talked a little bit about institutional power, I think was the word you used. Did you use that? I want to put words in your mouth. But what I what I really want to get at is, is, is or what I want to follow up with about some of the issues around, um, you know, the history of art is the history of things that have been photographed. 
yeah. and and how the digital stands to what you see as the as both the sort of perhaps ethical obligations or ethical opportunities to to expand the field how how are i mean obviously doing that as a process of mechanics but do you see evidence of that happening and what is the potential in your mind of the of the digital photograph archive uh, or or the sort of digitization of art for um for broadening the reach of the field and for broadening access to the field yeah so i mean i i said power generally i think that's institutional power but it's all forms of sort of social and economic and, and geopolitical power um and I think in the case of digitization, we always have to remember that there's just so much more information about European art out there, <laughs> digital and otherwise. And that there, you know, it's difficult to imagine a scenario where we're able to produce, you know, that we've had decades of doing this in art history, right? Of a field that's tended to focus on European art. So, you know, while I think it's really important and necessary to start. To, to not start to continue and, and, and expand the digitization of, of cultural heritage outside of, of Europe and outside of, you know, in, to create a more sort of diverse digital, um, in, in, you know, set of information. I think we also have to think about how biases in the way we talk about art are already encoded in those, in those databases. So for example, in our one project we're working on here has to do with our art historical photo archives that, and we're thinking about like how we're, on the one hand, how are these things organized and how have, have these traditional methods of organization, which is physical organization, like Flemish school, Netherlandish school, et cetera, but that physical organization is, becomes the basis for its digital organization. And so in, in some ways we're just sort of reinscribing these biases on the digital collections that exist in physical collections. And in fact, there are ways uh, you can try to mitigate that, to think about other ways someone might use this collection besides studying European art. So I think in addition to sort of focusing on digitizing non-European collections, we should also be thinking about are the ways we can use collections of European objects or European art history to tell stories about what isn't there or why things are excluded or why we have defined art in particular ways or you know, the role of nationalism and why we, you know, what, we, what do we think Flemish art, the Flemish school looks like? What, you know, what did we think it looked like you know, in the 1970s versus now, et cetera? Um, so that's and this this is a good example because I think that the Reichs Museum was one of the early uh, institutions in terms of making their entire collection downloadable as a data set. But what that implied right away was that that any project that tried to do something with that data had to had to take institutional critique or collection critique, collection formation critique as one of its questions because otherwise you weren't getting a a transparent yeah. view of, of art, you are getting specifically the Reich's view of art, which is broad, narrow, whatever it is. But you have to answer it's what- contingent. Yeah, it's, it's contingent. Yeah, it's basically, yeah. Quite right, quite right. Please, Austin, I imagine, do you have a question that you wanna? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I've really enjoyed that. And I, I was, I'm coming at your talk from different angles, one of which is conservation and, and feeling very much that we are generators of images, but we aren't imaging scientists in the same sense of yeah. the term. And I think there's a feeling on my my part, definitely, that I'm I'm not an archivist, and I don't. I'm a conservator, a conservation scientist. We generate a huge amount of data, some of mm -hmm. which we want to delete because it's not right. a good image, and right. we end up it ends up on our files, and then we end up having to label it and interpret it as a bad image at one point. But I was wondering, I mean, this, 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 this balance between the imaging scientists who might be working on digitization of perhaps objects, but also the, the, the or, or it, paintings or, what, or, or, or scanning, and, and conservators who are generating new data, which we then have to somehow label, add the metadata, add the interpretation, knowing that our interpretation is uh, may or may not be enriched by other kinds of scientific data. I was just wondering if you could reflect a little bit more on that 
the difference between conservation and image science and where they where they meet well i think um i don't know if i could you know not being either myself i think the thing that's relevant or that i think about a lot working at a place where i you know work with archivists imaging scientists and conservators is the way on the one hand we all work in with data but in ways that have been that have developed and been established within our respective fields of expertise but now what we're seeing is a kind of more porous borders between these things i think um if you think of like you know even uh how you create an x-ray 20 50 years ago versus how you do now and how um, that we all use the same laptop <laughs> to create and manage this data, even if we're using different software applications. And I think on the level of a, one, an individual person or even a few that might not matter, but at scale, you start to see this as an ecosystem of data exchange, where suddenly the decisions about standards um, or methods of practice that are established in one aspect of that ecosystem have ripple effects in a sort of, you know, unexpected maybe ways um, than they have had before. And so um, I know, you know a lot of any project that I work on here often entails me coming to a table with people from these different expertise who've been trained to create and use data in ways that maybe make a lot of sense for an archivist, but make no sense for a scholar, for example. So for example, like a big trend in archival and library science is the use of aggregators. This feeling that people just wanna, they don't wanna have to do multiple searches, they wanna search in one place where they can find everything. Which from an archive and library standpoint might make a lot of sense, but we've done lots of surveys of scholars and it turns out nobody seems to use aggr aggregators or likes to use them. So you, that's just one simple example that we can find sort of um, tensions between these these areas of practice. So I was thinking through how we might, if we were to think of imaging science more akin to conservation science, they're not the same, but what might we learn from, you know, sort of that juxtaposition? And then of course, in relation also to uh, like academic scholarship. That's great. I was also really um, taken with your reference to the vinegar syndrome, knowing that both the digital and the um, um, uh, analog do, do have a shelf life. Um, we hope That's the right. digital won't, but we are very aware in our own practice of, I was looking through files that we have of images taken with colleagues at the Getty about 20 years ago, we can still open them, mm -hmm. but they are, they're kind of small, they, they're not publication quality anymore. Right. Um, as digital images and that they're become they're, they were taken with a uh, a camera but one of the first digital cameras um so they're a kind of testament to the history of our department but if i printed them out now they would be probably the right um, but I, I was wondering if they writing this whether thinking about the unicorn tapestry if either a doing the same thing now would be the matter of an afternoon's work or but also b whether like those files that they created in the early 2000s are now like functionally useless yeah <laughs> i had another question for you about about the rcv and the interpretation mm -hmm. the interpretation whose choice it was to put the tax records rather than for example the 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 schools or the 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 the, the, the trees on there was that arusha uh Rocher's, something related to his interpretation of the the values of the of sunset boulevard well, so the tax rex, ta tax assessment information does not appear in the interface but rather because Part of what we're thinking through is um, if we want to encourage people to work natively in data, scholarship natively in data, then how can we present it in ways that they can take it and link it up with other data sets? So in this case, allowing people to download the geospatial information that can be used as to crosswalk over to other kinds of data sets that are also tagged to, to geospatial information, one example being tax assessor data. And some scholars that we've worked with here are um, doing just that, sort of tracing um, architectural and economic development in, along Hollywood Boulevard through a certain time frame. They've taken, so they're taking Rocher's work and using it to, to tell this kind of very different story. Although recognizing that this is 
the work of a particular artist, author, um, but using this as kind of raw material to, to explore architectural uh, change over time. So we didn't actually put the tax assessor data in the, the user interface. We, we have several questions in the chat. Um, the first is a pair of questions that are, uh, well, a, that are both practical and sort of a comment, I think, from Carolyn Whitson. Um, Carolyn starts by saying, you mentioned two books at the beginning on digital imaging and art history. Could you please cite them again or put the references in the chat? Um, any recommended reading is appreciated. Um, do you, sure. do you want to just tell us what, it, what we are? Layla may be able to add them to the chat as we go too. Um, sure, yeah. Well, one I think that's particularly good is um, actually none of them, I don't know if I reference any that are specifically about digital imaging. About the, the ones about I was referring to were about object. photography, yeah. yeah. But um, the Frederick Borer piece um, called, um, my papers all are all out of order, but um, Photography and the Institutional Formation of Art History from 2002. Um, it's, it's, in a, it's in a collection called Art History and its Institutions, I think. Um, and then two other books that I think just provide a great example of what I'd like to see happen with digital images. And that is a sort of understanding how representation has shaped the writing of art history. Um, one is Claire Zimmerman, Zimmerman who has a book called Photographic Architecture in the 20th Century from 2014. And then another book, um, uh, Getty Research Institute publication, I should mention, called Photography and Sculpture, The Art Object and Reproduction. There's actually quite a rich um, bibliography on topics like slides, the use of slides in art history from that goes back, you know, quite a, there's a wonderful article by the um, woman who managed this library, I think at the Barnes Foundation called The Lore and the Trap of Color Slides. <laughs> so there's this kind of running theme of like illusion, um, you know, fooling people with images, the difference between a representation and the object itself, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those are, are three that I mentioned. Great. And, and, and Leila from the research forum says that she can, that she'll send you a sort of post, I'm saying this to everybody now, um, we'll send out a sort of post uh, event email and can include these citations um, in her email. So thank you so much for that, Leila. Carolyn goes on to say, now there are several questions, so I need to get moving. Unraveling a thread from my point, Stephen's point, there are, are both democratizing and proprietizing implications of making and sharing um, image data. Um, she says, first, more students and scholars can access works that earlier were behind institutional doors and required many hoops to jump through for access. No doubt mm -hmm. true. Second, the museum's super data becomes proprietary and makes demands that scholars are poaching if they make their own images from public display for their publications. Um, do you see uh, the do you see um, changes? Does the, is this connected to? Is any of this connected to changes in the way that Im museums are choosing to control images, as uh, particularly perhaps images of speaking of our Southern Renaissance paintings of works that are otherwise in the public domain? Um, are there implications for this type of access and sale of, of image data? Well, it's interesting. The Getty is very much a, a a supporter of open and free share of images. So here we don't wouldn't have the issue of you know the museum trying you know controlling necessarily you know um, whether how depending on the particular artwork of course if people are taking pictures of it in the galleries and that sort of thing. But I think what you do see is that museums, libraries, and archives recognize that the images that they create, particularly um, if they are not you know, are they not rights restricted and thus can appear in high resolution on their, you know, collections access points. They see them floating out there in the world uh, everywhere. In fact, when I was working on this talk, I found a, a version of not the engraved gem I showed, but another one that was on a stock photo website and they were charging for it. <laughs> so if you didn't know where the image came from, of course, no, it doesn't mention the Getty, you wouldn't know. Um, that you can get a very high resolution version of that image for free. Um, and it's because, so I think the question then becomes like, how is 
not so much how the images are controlled, but what, what museums and archives and libraries get very concerned about is how the data is controlled because they wanna make sure that accurate information about their collections is circulating out there. So whereas in an earlier period of what I called institutionally confined research, there was a kind of gatekeeping that happened at the site where, and you had access to an archivist, to a curator who knew the collection, who could, who could give you the verifiable information. But now you might find an image of something through Google image search. And so the focus has become much more on citing that authority in the data standards rather than in the institutions that are creating the data, if that makes sense. Um, but I would also say we're still at a moment where sort of older methods of photographic creation, reproduction, and licensing are still kind of in tension with the reality of data that's kind of floating around willy-nilly and can kind of be found anywhere. Um, and that's, I think, going to take a little while to resolve. <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, Stephanie Caruso asks, how do you maximize your contribution of metadata to digital collections when we are trained to look at this material as a specialist from one perspective? Mm. I.e., I'm digitizing a collection of photographs of Syria, an institution prioritizing Byzantine materials. I recognize that because these pictures were taken in the 1990s, these could be equally valuable to historians of the modern Middle East. Yeah, that's a great question. It's one reason why with Ruscha's collection, because it's this incredible trove. I mean, it's a document of Los Angeles for 50 plus years, um, a kind of minute documentation of not just, you know, famous sites, but sort of every vernacular architecture, right? So one of the things we thought of, about and started a research project around was like, what are the other stories that can be found in this archive? Knowing on the one hand, that this is the work of a white male artist photographing primarily West LA, you know, not necessarily South Central or other, you know, parts. But nonetheless, you can find all kinds of stories of in this archive about other people, other um, populations, communities in LA, um, as well as, you know, architectural histories outside of mainstream architecture. Uh, but it was sort of something we had to kind of engineer and think about sort of explicitly design a research project around. Traditionally, archivists and librarians, their, their goal is to, to catalog these things agnostic of particular research questions because they don't know how it will be used and it needs to be accessible no matter what your research question is. But at some at times that can mean, you know, that, you know, cataloging something at a kind of higher agnostic level means that individual things or more detailed things are lost. Uh, they also don't have time necessarily to catalog everything as extensively as they might want to. And in fact, there's a whole trend in the archive field um, called more product, less process that focuses on just sort of getting the stuff out there. <laughs> um, so I think it is a real tension, you know, sort of, and then the, it sort of scale, it's a tension that scales along with the production of images. With the more that's out there, the harder there is to understand what is in it and what it can do. Um, so yeah, I, that's not a real great definitive answer to the question, but an acknowledgement that it's a really, I think, important and interesting one. Well, and it's, it's particularly striking because some of the, there is, there is in you know, closer to home from my own field, work going on, particularly now in Florence, I mean, on Florentine history, that, that is juxtaposing architectural history with, um, with surveys and, and, um, and tax records and things like this, and is actually of interest to a wide diversity of different fields. And you wonder who out there is the social scientist of LA who is going to first discover that Ed Ruscha's project actually yeah. provides all this data that might be super, super useful, um, but would never have thought that the Getty was where they were gonna go and find right. their, their material. There are two questions actually linked to AI and conservation, and mm -hmm. I'm gonna pose them both because I've seen that they're connected and I don't know whether Austin is following the questions, but also because I think that both of you may want to weigh in. Um, so I'll, I'll ask them both. So uh, Megan Vanderdrift uh, writes, I've seen a few reports recently on the use of machine learning and, and AI or artificial intelligence in helping with reconstruction or conservation of damaged or even lost paintings. Do you have any thoughts on the use of this technology? For example, where it might be most appropriate 
or where we might be running into ethical in, uh, issues. And just to add to that, Richard Herbert um, has uh, asked about the current project at the National Gallery in, in London uh, about um, the painting of Samson Delilah, traditionally attributed to Rubens, um, in which uh, AI analysis of digital images um, has begun to suggest that perhaps this attribution is incorrect. The, the, so those are two separate questions, um, but perhaps related. And I know nothing about Rubens, and so therefore I'm definitely giving it away. But first, do you have any thoughts on the use of AI uh, and machine learning for conservation um, uh, and the ethics or um, or appropriateness of this process? And maybe that's a question for for both of you. Well, I think undoubtedly there's a there's a role for artificial intelligence and, com and computer vision in, in this work. I think the, the biggest issue with it at the moment is that, I mean, it's even more of a black box than what we've been saying about digital imaging, you know? It's really, you know, neural networks are trained um, and, and they, you know, we put information in and then information is spit out and it's not always clear what's going on in between. So um, I think you really have to look at these projects on a case by case basis and determine whether the, the particular, you know, the decisions being made and the people involved are, you know, to what extent are they adhering to sort of rigorous guidelines. I will say in the um, archival and music um, library space, I mean, there's seems like a conference on computer vision every week, uh, because this is being looked at as a possible way to be able to process collections at scale. It's also, I would add, you know, something that is intriguing as a possibility of getting around what we were talking about in terms of the limitations of textual metadata. So if there are say biased terms or et cetera, you know, being able to analyze these images on a pixel level can help you sort of um, get around some of those sort of cultural biases that creep into to metadata. But um, Austin, maybe you have a thought. No, no I would. I would. I would thoroughly agree with you. I think that the you know, computer vision is maybe a, a more easily understood area of neural networks and the, 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 the advances that we've seen in reading manuscripts and weird writing and writing over writing. There was a great example of Marie Antoinette's letters which had been, which had been uh, censored, which we can now read some of through, you know, great. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we do with that information is is and, and how we might translate that into a conservation treatment that's another story mm -hmm. um I, I would say that the a lot of the 80, 1980s 90s uh 70s 80s 90s restorations that were done using you know strange techniques of reintegration well you know they look at them now and they kind of look extremely dated and highly interpreted so and that was done by a, a person acting like a machine um if I may, um, and instead a machine acting like a person that might give us something which gives us another type of, of reconstruction. As long as we are able to recognize that as a, as a hypothetical reconstruction and we don't paste it on top of the original. But I would say there, you know, we, we're using technology now in totally different ways to reconstruct losses. Uh, there was a great example of 3D printing of a Van Gogh loss because there was the painting was almost fine except for an area which was damaged and uh and computers really can help us uh, recreate the textures in ways that we can't as human beings so uh, i think we have to be and and on the on the issue of the rubens example that's also a bit of a black box in terms of the the analysis of brushwork um and we have to take it, I think, very much, Emily, as you said, on a case by case basis and really see what are what are what do we understand? What is this computer telling us? Is it? Um, but that that's computer, uh, uh, you know, neural networks on computers. That's, that's a whole science in itself, which, um, you know, which which we may or may not understand. I think part of what we're getting at is the difference between the use of a particular technology in one instance and the sort of integration of that as a practice in a field. Um, and what we're where we're at right now with computer vision is like sort of seeing what can be done and testing different approaches. But 
we're certainly not at the level where this is becoming part of how we do things, which you know is, is kind of a different thing entirely. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Austin, do you have other questions? Yeah, I was I was going to come back just a moment to the decolonizing digitization issue. You know, we mm -hmm. talk about decolonizing, and, and Los Angeles is a perfect place. You know, where I know so much energy is going towards that. So we've been discussing that at the courthold, and I know it, in our own collection we are trying to digitize and highlight what we have at the in the in the courthold photography collections, and we'll be showing something at the in the opening of the of the new courthold galleries uh, next month. But I was wondering how you see the, you know, your role in that decolonize what what can what can we do as as you know conservators archivists digitized specialists what is it that we should be aware of in this movement now that you, you mentioned that we, we recognize bandwidth as access and what is digitized and what is prioritized um what 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 could we, what should we be more conscious of well i think you know sort of always for me, whenever I'm thinking about technologies, I'm trying always to think about them in the context of positionality and, and not to take any for, for granted or make any assumptions, um, which can be hard to do when you literally work on top of a cold mountain. You know? <laughs> um, and, but I think you know, there's so much that is naturalized. I mean, Stephen, you made a good point at the beginning about estrangement. You know, there's so much about how we work that's naturalized um, that it can be difficult. And we're so busy, um, et cetera, et cetera. It can be difficult to sort of maintain that distance and that sense of estrangement. And I feel like that's kind of my my role. It's sort of something I try to do in my own work, but also some a role I try to take on within the Getty and, and with my department is to sort of, because um, in a sense, technology does, viewing things from the standpoint of technology, it does give me this window into there's another, there might be another way to do things or how have, how have these things we're just so used to doing have these longer histories that weren't always like that. Uh, um, we didn't always do things this way. And so, um, you know, always trying to think about those two things in relation because, of course, technologies are not neutral and they are embedded in the same power structures as is our history. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon us to always um, deploy technologies with that the set of questions with an eye towards, you know, um, what are we assuming? And also, I think just um, talking to folks who don't who work on fields outside of what I do. Um, and for example, uh, I've been working with this uh, scholar of photography. He uh, comes from Indonesia. He uh, was talking about how he's been in conversations um, at music with museums in the Netherlands about problematic or racist terminology and how um, they're trying to get rid of the, they were in a, in a conversation about removing the word coolie from their metadata terms but he was saying we don't understand that as an offensive term <laughs> in Indonesia so you could see these things where you know all kinds of ways in which if you're only thinking from your own perspective you will lose so much and so it's I think about you know asking the question trying not to take things for granted and then just talking to people who represent other perspectives I thought that's a wonderful answer thank you I think that's a really wonderful note to end on. Um, Emily, I really want to thank you so much for coming, for sharing your research um, and this really rich paper and for your great questions. Thank you all for coming. I want to let you know that the um, next uh, event, yes, I just see that, <laughs> that question has just come up and I'm just about to tell you. Um, the next uh, talk in this series um, will be on the 23rd of November, um, given by Pulitzer Prize winning architect, Alison Killing, who has been 
uh, at the forefront of using open source uh, or at least open available um, mapping data in, in contexts like Google Earth um, to understand the shifting architectural uh, landscape of Xinjiang uh, in Western China and the growing system of Chinese detention camps uh, in the West, looking at uh, both digital mapping and uh, architectural methods um, in that area. And so we'd really welcome you to join us on the 23rd of November. And again, thank you so much, Emily. Um, it was a pleasure to see you. And um, thank you again. Thank you. And thanks to the audience. Evening. Take care, everybody.